five more joining us from the waiting room. Welcome everyone uh, to Yellow Springs Forward, our first community forum, and we'll be uh, getting started momentarily. Dr. Holden, we're up over 50 participants at this point, uh, and I continue to have the waiting room active, so I'll be able to have people join as we go. Um, you tell us what, when you feel comfortable uh, moving forward with, uh, with starting our presentation. Sorry, I was, I was muted. <laughs> I think we're good. We have a big agenda, so I think we should get started. All right, that's great. Um, again, welcome everybody um, to the Yellow Springs Forward First Community Forum. Uh, we appreciate your time this evening, uh, and we hope that this evening will be uh, valuable and informative um, to you as members of the Yellow Springs community. So a few notes on the process tonight. Um, there's a chat function that you can take advantage of to submit questions. Um, so in your control, in your Zoom control window, you'll find that chat box or access to that chat box. So um, please feel free to take advantage of that. Um, this presentation will also be made available on the yellowspringsforward.com website at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, you can also submit additional questions through that website. Um, and let's see, we have a series of presenters today um, with uh, hopefully some assistance from our uh, community advisory team and our educational visioning team members. All right. So tonight we're gonna walk through the process. Um, we're gonna kind of take you back a little bit historically and talk about where we've been. Uh, we're gonna give you an update on educational visioning and what the community advisory team has done to date. And we're gonna talk um, briefly about next steps. And finally, we'll, we want to devote some time um, to responding to your questions in the, that, that you submit through the chat window. So that's where we're heading tonight. As Dr. Holden mentioned, we have a lot of work to get done. Um, I should probably introduce myself. I am Jeff Parker with SHP. We are uh, the master planning and educational planning consultants uh, enlisted to walk with the district through this process. I've got several teammates with me. Um, Carrie Malatesta, she's working with the, uh, the educational visioning team. Uh, Todd Thackeray is leading the master planning kind of details, nuts and bolts processes, and Shay McMahon is doing everything else uh, and everything in between. <laughs> so that's your SHP team. A little bit about the master planning process. Let's see, yeah. Um, the goal of any successful master plan is to be 
educationally fantastic. We wanted to be financially appropriate and we needed to be community supported. So that's what, what we're looking for. That's what we're striving for. Um, and that's, uh, that's the intent of where we're gonna, where this process is gonna take us. So again, educationally fantastic, financially appropriate and community supported. Um, we've, to do that, we have created two kind of parallel teams. Uh, one is the community advisory team. This team is composed of uh, neighbors of yours, uh, folks from the uh, Yellow Springs community. And their purpose is to kind of speak into the process to reflect the values and concerns of the Yellow Springs community and to help advise on on what makes sense, you know, what is appropriate for Yellow Springs. And the other group is the educational visioning team. Um, that group is composed uh, mainly of folks connected directly with the schools, uh, parents, um, teachers, students, and that we have about 40 people in that group and about 40 people in the community advisory team. So those groups, the educational visioning team is the purpose of that group is to kind of walk through um, how we teach and learn in Yellow Springs and determine what impact, if any, that has on the buildings we operate in. Um, and I kind of got ahead of myself, um, but this is the all of that kind of spelled out for you. Um, the community advisory team, uh, understanding educational needs, facility conditions, financial implications, and advise in the development of an appropriate master plan. And the educational visioning team is to um, understand the educational delivery. You know, how do we teach and learn in Yellow Springs? And really, what does that mean for the buildings that we do it in? This is the overall timeline. You can see the, um, let's see, let me kind of grab my pointer here. We've got the two groups identified, the community advisory team here, the educational visioning team here. There's a, another kind of support team. This is the financial advisory team. Uh, this is led by the district administrators, especially uh, uh, the, the treasurer, the district treasurer. You can also see we've got series of community forums here um, and we're going to do some concept testing so we're actually going to be um, you know using some scientific polling methods uh, to really gauge what is supported by the community what is most appropriate for the community um, and if everything goes as planned uh, we'll be ready to make a recommendation here in uh oops, sorry about that here in late April to the Board of, of Education. Again, educationally fantastic, financially appropriate and community supported. That's what we're going for. All right. So with that, um, we've asked Dr. Holden to offer a bit of a historical perspective. Dr. Holden. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I appreciate it. You know, we're going to need everyone engaged in these discussions. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about what I know uh, through my discussions and uh, research since I've been here in the district about what has happened in the past and where we are right now. So I'm sure that most, if not all of you remember, in uh, May of 2018, the district put a bond issue on the ballot. And that bond issue was for 4.7 mills, um, and that's a, a, a unit um, of money, uh, a 4.7 mill property tax for $12,688,963 over 37 years, excuse me, to renovate the 712 campus, as well as a 0.25% uh, income tax increase for 30 years. Um, combinations like that are typical when you're talking about bond issues. 
um, the results. Uh, this issue went down uh, qu quite handily. Um, there were 35.8% of the voters, and that was 730 out of 2,039 voters. Four, and 64.2% against, and that was 1,309 out of 2,039 voters. So it's my understanding that the bond issue was presented at that time as a way to address an item that was in the class of 2020 strategic plan. And that was priority five that said a priority of the district. And, and this was written um, years before that. Priority five said that uh, the responsibility was to ensure a functional and supportive learning infrastructure um, i.e. a physical and technological environment that aligns with the curriculum, school community values, and expansive learning. So it was because of that, and quite simply because of uh, the age uh, of the buildings, um, that the bond issue was put on the ballot in May of 2018. Prior to that, there were a number of engagement um, meetings. So there, were, there was a facility advisory committee meeting um, and these were in, in the spring of 2017. Um, two community forums in, in that summer of 2017, there were two community pulse meetings, actually three community pulse meetings, and then March of 2018, another community forum meeting. Um, at that time, the district, in, in preparing for this May 2018 bond issue, um, the district reached out to the Ohio uh, Facilities uh, Construction Commission. Um, and at that time, the district qualified for a 17% reimbursement. Uh, I don't wanna get us into the details at this time, although we're gonna get there pretty quickly. Um, but the district did not um, go through with that offer. Um, after the failure of the May 18 bond issue, uh, the superintendent um, really was trying to get at, okay, where did we misstep? And how do we look at our facilities issues? Because uh, pass or fail, the facility issues don't go away. Um, he created a facilities task force um, with the goal of engaging a, a group of individuals, some of whom were not supporters because he wanted their perspective about how to address the district's facilities. That group met, um, I think, longer than um, intended or probably longer than they wanted to. And in February of 2020, they presented um, a list of priorities to the Board of Education. Um, they examined multiple assessments and their priorities um, were really based upon, and these are my terms, what I would call a repair and maintain approach. Um, during this time of the facilities task force, the district solicited a second facilities assessment from another architectural engineering firm. That firm um, came up with an assessment that was uh, roughly equivalent to what the state had, had done. Um, and then the district also solicited a land use um, uh, analysis for both the Mills Lawn site and the middle school, high school site to see um, what the property was currently worth and what the property might be worth um, if developed because the district was considering um, the financial pieces to this. Do, would you like me to go on, Jeff? <laughs> I, could, I could pick it up from here and maybe cover Thank a few you. of the slides here about the historical perspective. Thank you, Shay. Uh, Jeff, if you could jump back one more about the facilities task force, I'll just kind of give a summary of that section. That this was a community-led group that uh, Dr. Holden mentioned. Their focus really was on verifying and expanding facility assessments. They analyzed the renovation versus replacement costs of each of the buildings that you have active in the district. And then as Dr. Holden mentioned, kind of created that highest priority list by building. We've mentioned a couple of times, um, we've mentioned a couple of times the ysforward.com website. This is a place where you can get all of the information, every presentation that we give, every educational visioning session, community advisory team, everything that we can share 
uh, we are posting. Uh, this includes all the documentation about questions that have come up through the process, uh, everything down to the 1948 letter that was written uh, by Antioch College to the school district. So there's a lot of really detailed information here, and it's a great opportunity for you to dive into some of these details uh, and start to, to uh, kind of search through the process that these two parallel teams are going through as well. So I would, I would drive you there. That's something that Dr. Holden and really the entire district administration team has been highly committed to transparency throughout this process. Uh, and as we've helped craft this website, uh, that's been a uh, really important piece to Dr. Holden to make sure that all the documentation that the community advisory team and the educational visioning team is considering is out there for public consumption and consideration as well. So I would urge you to go there to kind of learn more about the historical perspective. Uh, if I could uh, ask you real quick, Jeff, to jump to slide. Oh, goodness, one sec. Uh, yeah, right there on slide 15. Uh, we'll talk about how that process kind of has uh, worked through uh, these two teams, and I'll turn it over to you for a deeper look at the progress that we've made with the educational visioning team. Thank you, Shay. As we mentioned earlier, um, there are two teams engaged. One is the educational visioning team. They have met um, several times at this point. Uh, we had our fourth meeting, fourth of seven, last night, or yesterday afternoon, actually. And uh, they've been addressing a lot of questions. Um, but again, they are a diverse team, students, teachers, parents, district administrators, um, all speaking into what the solution is going to be here. Um, you can see here, we've got seven steps. We started out kind of confirming and clarifying the, the educational direction for SH for uh, Yellow Springs, pardon me. Um, and from now on, as we walk through the rest of the process, we're gonna be kind of dialing up the resolution to get a higher, um, a higher resolution image of what these what these spaces need to be. Uh, and this process is relevant to uh, regardless of, of, the, of if the solution is to um, renovate buildings or build new buildings. So this is really a valuable conversation regardless uh, of what the final solution is. We started out by understanding kind of the district's approach to learning. We talked about PBL and its role in, uh, you know, from the littlest kids to the biggest kids and the value of, uh, of learning that way and the importance, um, it, it, the important role it plays for, for the Yellow Springs students. Um, we've had several conversations. We've talked about whether or not PBL is right for us. You know, we didn't wanna just charge ahead assuming that everything is good. Um, the consensus was uh, that it does feel right, but there are a few ways we can improve. So um, there's a commitment to, uh, to project-based learning uh, there. Uh, then we had a lot of conversation about what does an ideal learning environment look like? Um, and we've tried to consider how other districts, other organizations are addressing kind of the changes that are occurring in learning. And then recently we've asked the group, do our buildings get in the way? Do they get in the way of our learning? Um, and we got some interesting responses. Um, so and these, uh, a lot of these are kind of uh, qualitative versus quantitative. Um, they're uncomfortable, both physically and environmentally. Um, you know, physically with regard to furnishings and the the kind of emotional atmosphere of the space, uh, environmentally with in regard to the acoustics and um, the uh, the temperature controls in the buildings. Um, there's no real place for collaboration. You know, collaboration is a um, is a key to the future of um, of well of everyone's future. Um, a key to the future of business success uh, and educational success. So we need to teach our students how to work together. Uh, and there's just no real way to do that today. Um, there is, you all likely know that the ex exhibition nights are a highlight uh, of the school year. 
and um, there's really no good place for those to occur. Um, there's a lot of separation and kind of segregation of the grades and of the departments in the existing buildings. You can't see what's going on. Um, everything's kind of concealed behind four walls. Uh, there are a lot of silos that occur uh, and it's hard to connect with each other. Um, also, one of the primary values that both the ed community advisory team and the educational vis visioning team highlighted was the need to get outside, you know, the connection to the ex to the ex to the outdoors. Um, and in your current facilities as they are today, um, it's hard to really take advantage of that. Um, uh, clearly, there are electrical and kind of data deficiencies in the existing facilities that aren't supporting the learning. Um, no really good place for presentations and performances. Um, air spaces are noisy. We talked about the, the environmental comfort. Um, there was a lot of conversation about the shoebox, the uh, modular classrooms at McKinney Middle School um, that I think were installed about 30 years ago as a temporary solution and uh, are still serving the district today. Um, and how those are uh, substandard for uh, for the teachers and the students. Um, there was some concern over the labs and their congestion and really the ability, they're the inability to curate the students' work. So much of PBL is sharing and display of students' work, their successes and of their struggles. Um, and there's no real place to uh, to do this in the existing facilities. So that covers the first criteria. And as I mentioned, we're about halfway through. And um, so we will begin to refine what these spaces look like and how they need to function. So the rest, the other half of the process is the community advisory team. And they cover the, they really bring all three together. So they will take the input from the educational visioning team. They will and, and align that with making sure that the spaces are, or that the plan is financially appropriate and community supported. One of the pieces that has changed uh, since the last time the district was on the ballot and the last time that the facilities task force was assembled uh, is an increase in the funding offer from the state of Ohio. The current offer for state funding for a school building uh, here in Yellow Springs is 26% of the total cost. In the past, and we looked at a historical perspective over the past 10 years, this offer has ranged between 14% state funding and 20% state funding. And in 2017, on the previous bond issue attempt, uh, when this was considered, the offer was 17% from the state. So the increase in the funding percentage uh, is, a, is one factor. A second factor is an eligibility for the expedited local partnership program. And that's the second bullet point here. This is a state program that allows uh, a district to essentially not wait in line the way that some other programs um, require, if that makes sense. And there are a lot of details with the state program that we'll continue to cover here through this presentation. Uh, but the eligibility and the increase in funding are two factors that have kind of led the district to uh, assemble these community groups to consider the future. The overall costs have been updated as well to better align with the current construction costs and the bidding market. So the district is going to be able to use what the state calls the 2021 cost sets. And that would be an opportunity to make sure that the budget uh, that we are planning for and the budget that is taken to the taxpayers and the request best aligns with the current bidding market. So there are no surprises throughout the process. These are three factors that really drove the district to use the basis of what was learned from the facilities task force and the information gathered there and to uh, continue to build on that with the new information available from the state. Jeff, if you would. Uh, there are a few guidelines of working with the state. Uh, Todd Thackeray is on here with us as well. Uh, and I'll touch on a couple of these and maybe turn it over to Todd here uh, to talk uh, through some of the details. Uh, all buildings of the state fund through this or any of their programs must be at least 350 students. This is a rule that was determined to uh, improve efficiency for long-term long -term operating expenses. And in terms of just design and constructing a building of this size, this is the 
lessons learned from the state that a building should be no fewer, be built to house no fewer than 350 students. The budget and size of the building offered by the state will be based on your enrollment projections. So today and looking into the future. Our most recent projections show a current enrollment of less than 700 students and a future enrollment five and 10 years into the future that is also uh, less than 700 students and uh, gradually declining through that process or through those years. Uh, and then the state also, and what we'd like to share with you and what the Yellow Springs News has uh, recently published in, in their publication, uh, talks about some of the master plan options that the state has offered to fund. With the master plan options extra cost, and there are a lot of uh, details that determine what is considered a uh, locally funded initiative or those efforts that are 100% covered by the state, or I'm sorry, covered by the district. Um, that is gonna be a continuing effort of the community advisory team and these community forums to help test some of those options. And if the value is there to 100% fund those op uh, opportunities by the district. Todd, I'll turn it over to you for the next slide to look at the task force findings about the cost to renovate and the cost to replace. Uh, Todd, it looks like you're still muted there. <laughs> the most classic uh, Zoom st sentence of the year. I think Thank you. <laughs> there we go. We have you now. Thank you. Thank you again, Shay. Um, so as Dr. Holden uh, shared earlier, the facilities task force uh, operated from 2019 into 2020. And they had a consultant on board, and this was the overall assessment of Mills Lawn and the high school and middle school that based on the current conditions and to bring all of these components and systems and materials up to current, basically state standards, um, Mills Lawn cost, would cost 11.7 million as compared to replacing the building at a cost of 12.2 and the high school middle school would actually cost 19.7 million compared to a replacement cost of 19.2 essentially. Um, so anyway, they concluded that there was a lot of need at the buildings and their recommendation was just the critical pieces out of that, but it was not a long-term fix. So anyway, it is an option to renovate those two buildings without the state's involvement. So that's what option zero is. The continuation of the current plan is maintain these buildings and increase the funding to maintain those buildings potentially as recommended by the facilities task force uh, at the most critical, or you even have the option of, you know, fully renovating those buildings. And then you raise the question of what else do we need to do to those buildings to make those educationally appropriate? Um, and the state won't co-fund those. Okay, so that was option zero. The three options that the state shared that they would offer co-funding was the first option was to build a new K-12 building. Both of your existing buildings, as you just saw, qualified for replacement because they exceeded two thirds of the cost of a new building. So that's the state's bar and they recommend that if it costs more than two thirds of replacement costs, replace the buildings, get entirely new infrastructure. Okay, so the new, new K-12 building, you would do it by state standards. Uh, you would be set up to receive 26% reimbursement. You would have the option of where it would be located. The land that you currently own that is large enough to do this is your current middle school, high school site. This, which is um, over 30 acres. The state's recommendation for the ideal site for a building of this size for a single K-12 building of close to 700 students is 47 acres. And that accommodates parking and bus drop-offs and playgrounds and practice fields, all those kinds of things. Okay. Todd, I'll, I'll add that that 47 acres is just a recommendation. It's not a mandate. Um, it's just kind of based on the state's experience that is a comfortable size 
uh, campus for what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you. Option two, uh, this options two and three, both reuse the existing middle school, high school. For option number two, they only retained the original core of the building, which contains the gym area and the 2002 addition on the west side of it. The three-story appendage and the octagon and the modulars were removed in this in a new addition to make the entire building the appropriate size was the approach. Jeff is going to refresh the presentation there to get the uh, the site plan at the middle school, high school to load into that properly. Okay. One second. Appreciate your patience. It is right here. This gives you a look at the 40 plus acre site or around 40 acre site at the middle school and high school. Uh, and this is where from option two, the renovation and major addition to the high school and middle school could take place somewhere on the site. So you own that entire parcel. Um, the piece that is cut out there is the ESC. So one of your one of your key partners is there on site with you. And Todd, the, the portions of the building in option two that may be renovated, can we highlight those for the for the listeners? You may be able to. So I don't think gym. I can. So the gym is one. Yep. Just to the left of that is the 2002 edition. Okay, right in here. And covered by the word middle and school is the, uh, the modular classrooms that were integrated into the building. Those would go. To the right, the three-story component would go. And to the top, the octagon would go. Thank you. All right, so option three is the same basic approach, but to keep the entire existing middle school, high school building. So the, oh, octagon, the octagon and the three-story would remain. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, those are the three options they have done initial calculations on. Okay. All right. So the community advisory team has been charged with looking at any and all facility master plan approaches that they can come up with and that you can come up with. Right now, the hopper is wide open and we are accepting any and all ideas for what the future facility configuration would be for the Yellow Springs District. Um, after this, we will begin to funnel these things through filters of cost and educational uh, benefit and community support. Okay, so to, tonight the, the door is wide open. Come up with any idea you want. <laughs> um, we don't know the costs, the final costs yet. Um, the state's budgets for new construction were actually just updated in December of 2020. Uh, they hadn't been changed since spring of 2019. Um, they updated the new cost sets, but the renovation cost sets aren't scheduled to be finalized until April, okay? We can take some guesses, but we, we don't wanna share inaccurate information with you if we can avoid it. And I'd like to note that those renovation costs will be finalized before the conclusion of this process. So the community advisory team will have the opportunity and you as a community member will have the opportunity to understand those full renovation costs before the end of this uh, entire process. Yes. 
and future forums. So there are two more forums scheduled that we'll talk about at the, at the end here. Uh, and those are on the YS Forward site as well. Uh, those will be much more focused on concept testing, understanding the details and understanding the cost and uh, financial implications of the different plans. Right now, we really truly are at the phase of learning the different options, understanding the options in depth, but we'll continue to take those kind of down the funnel of the decision-making with these two community groups. Todd, go ahead. Or Jeff, could you jump back one slide and I'll cover that one. Uh, so really the question right now, option zero uh, that we noted on here is what the district is doing now and doing everything they can to cover the uh, most vital priorities identified by the facilities task force. So the question that, the, that this facilities master planning process is attempting to answer is, is our current improvement plan educationally fantastic, financially appropriate and community supported, or should we consider a new path given the information that we have now? That is the, the full effort of the facilities master plan. And as has been noted, we've begun that process with the community groups, but we, do not, uh, we, we are not at the conclusion of that. This is not a final forum to present the results. It's rather a chance for you to hear the details and to start to gather some of these valuable questions that you're sending in the chat so that we can help community members understand them. So how will we eventually arrive at that decision? I mentioned that we have two more community forums planned for March 4th and 17th, uh, in all likelihood in the same format, uh, by Zoom and being broadcast a number of different locations, thanks to our local public access television for sharing it uh, over their broadcast, as well as their uh, live streaming on the YouTube page. And that will be available on YouTube uh, and the district and the YS Forward sites will have that link as well shortly. So thank you uh, for joining us tonight on, the, on this one and know that there are two more opportunities to do just this. The educational visioning team will continue to meet and they will complete their process to chart that course forward for the future of educational delivery in the district. Their report will then be provided to the community advisory team to really help them make that educationally fantastic recommendation and determination. They would, uh, they would, uh, they, will, they will deeply consider the results of the students' work and really a lot of what the educational visioning has been thus far is really listening to and learning from students. The educational visioning side is very student-driven. I think we had 24 students in the process as young as fifth graders uh, in our last meeting. So that report will be provided to the community advisory team to ensure that our master plan is educationally fantastic. Our budgets will be finalized. Uh, the renovation costs will be provided by the state that apply to options two and three, uh, and the true cost will be presented to all the teams and all the community members for each of these options. The community advisory team meetings at that point then would complete their efforts, uh, and that would be uh, uh, parallel with an effort to do community polling. This is a uh, statistically accurate and uh, professionally created polling effort by Paul Fallon and Associates. They're a common, uh, a group that has done hundreds, uh, if not thousands, I would say, of community focused polls in the past. And that's something that the school district and the board is considering at this time uh, to move forward with formal concept testing to hear your voice in a more formal way. And finally, the community advisory team will make a recommendation given your feedback as a community member, given all the different information they have available uh, and, and the final recommendation will be made to the board by the community advisory team. Uh, Shay, I'd just like to add regarding the true costs, um, the OFCC budgets, they include a construction contingency um, factor so that we, they work to anticipate uh, unforeseen conditions, um, you know, the, the, the changes that occur all the time in construction, there are funds allocated for that so that the district isn't left kind of holding a bag and um, trying to come up with additional funds. With that, I think we're gonna go to questions from the chat and I believe Shay, in the midst yep. of all this has been monitoring those. I have, uh, I'd like maybe Jeff, if you could stop screen sharing your screen there, we'll go to presentation mode. Uh, and I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Holden just for a few Quick thoughts, anything you'd like to clarify or, uh, or bring up from what we discussed in this brief presentation uh, as I get the, the questions ready to go here. 
It, yeah, I, I want to talk about this this notion of sites, <laughs> specifically Mills Lawn. Um, you know, there's been a lot of publicity about the Mills Lawn site. There's a group um, to preserve the Mills Lawn green space. Um, in fact, back long before winter break, I met with some folks that, that live right outside my window. Um, and I told them what I'm gonna tell you now. The district has no plans to sell that green space. And the reason we don't have any, any and I say green space, um, not in jest, but it, it, it's a school. <laughs> it may be used as a park, it may be used as green space, but it is a school. And, and I need it as a school right now. So there's no plan to do anything with that because whatever we decide has to come out of this process, right? Because right now, we don't know if we are renovating or building new. And so there's no way to say what we're gonna do with property. Um, I think, I want everyone to understand that when I speak for the district, I say, we understand the emotional, educational, therapeutic benefits of green space. Absolutely. But we are not in the position at this point, first of all, because we don't know what's happening with facilities. And secondly, we are not in the position to just say, here is our donation of Mills Lawn to the common good. And I say that because there has been a lot of talk about cost and, and I get that. And so we have to be good stewards, not only of the property, but also good stewards of the taxpayer money. So hopefully through this discussion, whatever we decide about our facilities, we can then collaborate about our sites. So I want you to hear it from me and I'm gonna to have to say it over and over again because um, there's some, I don't know, I, I, I say it and people don't believe it, but I'm gonna tell you again. There are no plans at this time to do anything with that site. Why? Because it is my elementary school and I need it for that. And I know the teachers on here um, feel the same way. There has been the district, I've been very public about the fact that the district has participated in a uh, collaborative grant that sometimes is referred to as the education district uh, grant to explore a school site on perhaps Antioch grounds. But I can't comment on that any more than I can comment on the Mills Lawn site because we don't know what we're gonna do. And so, I would appreciate if anybody has questions, please reach out to me. Um, I said it at the board meeting, I'm gonna say it now and I will say it again. Um, so I think, you know, collaboratively, we can come up with an excellent solution. We're just not there yet. So hopefully that addresses several questions that I've seen um, in the chat about that. Very good, thank you, Dr. Holden. Uh, I am going to kind of MC the questions and I'll read off. I've been screenshotting all the questions uh, and we'll make sure that we cover as many as possible. Uh, we are gonna stop at 7.30 uh, and we will, anything that we do not reach, uh, any questions that we do not get to answer um, during this session live, uh, we will post to the ysforward.com site. Okay, so we will get them answered in writing as soon as possible if we do not get to your question in the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'll just start chronologically. Uh, from Terry Smith, doc, discussions about developing Mills Lawn, what does that entail and what's the reaction to citizen concerns about preserving Mills Lawn in the planning process? Dr. Holden, anything you'd like to add uh, to what you what you had just mentioned? I mean, I feel like I, I just kind of addressed that, so. Yep, understood. I'll go to the, the next one chronologically. Uh, they say, I am relieved to know that there will be surveys and concept testing because the devil is in the details with facilities issues. Could you speak more about the survey? Will that be deployed to all voters or will you differentiate what the YSS employees, parents and rest want? Will you test out each sub question, K-12 building versus two buildings and renovating versus building new? 
and investing at the Mills Lawn site versus middle school, high school. I can take this one briefly. Um, the, the polling effort will be professionally designed and statistically uh, accurate through Fallon's uh, expertise. They will be doing some kind of concept testing, okay? So all the questions that you answered here about all of the different options maybe that are kind of floating around in the community, I can't guarantee that the survey will touch on all of those, but they will touch on and ask a lot of the same questions that you're asking uh, about the final master plan options that the community advisory team is considering. Okay, I think you maybe had sent this message before we had some of the uh, master plan options up there, uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to kind of note that, yes, that will be a survey that covers exactly what you're asking. Uh, and it right now, uh, I would have to ask that question of Fallon and Associates, uh, but typically what they do uh, to ensure statistical accuracy is they do a random dialing or a random outreach. Um, so they're not calling district employees exclusively, or I think you mentioned in here YSS employees. Um, it is a random dial to get a true cross-section of the community. Uh, that is typically the way that they deliver those polling efforts. Um, and I can't speak to the details of how that is conducted, um, but it's something that we could continue to look into and maybe get the answer from Fallon and Associates and post it on the ysforward.com website. Is that fair to say, Dr. Holden? Yes, it is. Good. Uh, I'll touch on Anna Hall's question. Uh, and some of this may, I might be able to answer it from the presentation. Uh, Todd, Jeff, Dr. Holden, anyone feel free to jump in and share your thoughts on any of these questions. With the potential of 26% of state funding, why is that not reflected in the total price tag? Why wouldn't that reduce the total amount required? Uh, just for clarity's sake, the 26% funding is for all of the options that the state has offered. And all of those options uh, create a K-12 facility, uh, if that makes sense. So the 26% state funding, the state will contribute 26% of the cost of construction. I, I, I can maybe take that. Sure. And then maybe somebody else that works uh, with this more frequently than me, but the, the state offers two programs. One is called the CFAP, Classroom Facilities Assistance Program, and one is the ELP program, Expedited Local Partnership Program. We have, um, again, you know, I, I hope that Todd will co correct any uh, flaws in my, in my understanding, but we have too much property wealth to qualify for a Classroom Facilities Assistance Program. That's, that's the program where you might see some districts getting large portions of their uh, building projects uh, paid for. We do qualify for expedited local partnership program. And with CFAP, that money does um, come off in my understanding. With ELP, we have to raise the entire amount and then we get that reimbursement from the state uh, after that. Um, you know, 26% is, is a lot, um, but that's the difference in the program. Um, and there are, I'm sure, many more things that go into it. I just gave you a simplified, uh, my simplified understanding of it. And I'd also like to add that reimbursement, um, which comes from the state, is projected to be anywhere between seven and 10 years out. So we would not receive that right away, but when we receive that, we would be able to pay off the bonds that we issued in order to do the project. There, there, Shay, there was a question that popped up, I think in response to Dr. Holden's point about the, the relative value of the district, the property wealth value of the district. Um, that is the, the whole Yellow Springs community. That is not parcels that are owned by the district and what their value is. So buying more property to increase or decrease your wealth um, really doesn't play into this equation. Wealth, wealth in that definition is total taxable property value in your district, not necessarily what the district has in its own coffers. There have been a couple questions. I think this might help. Um, I want to touch on one of the questions was about open enrollment and how that might affect the size of the building. I'm going to just kind of summarize a few of the things from the chat here. 
Um, would allowing greater open enrollment allow us to get a bigger building? Should we downsize the building based on um, open enrollment trends or how does that affect it? I'm gonna share my screen here briefly and just show you a page on the transparency site. Uh, this is the ysforward.com slash transparency. Uh, and there are uh, items on here that you'll be able to uh, dig into, including the enrollment projection data. The state offer is based on this recently updated enrollment projection. It's provided by FutureThink, which is a, a company developed to do exactly this. And it tells exactly what the enrollment is projected to be in the school year 2025 to 2026. There are a lot of factors that go into a report like this. Uh, you can see this is a 46 page document. So there's a lot to digest in terms of the input data. Someone asked in the questions about whether that uh, the new housing development has affected this. This does take into account building permits that have been filed. So if the building permits have been requested at this point, yes, they would have been included in the document that's posted there uh, and the study that was done and published on December 4th. In terms of open enrollment and the way that it affects the size of the building, um, Dr. Holden, you may be able to touch on this, Todd may be able to touch on this, but open enrollment is accounted for in here. Uh, and uh, I maybe should turn it over to, to you to talk about that more in detail. I, I can speak to that. So I, I spoke to our consultant and I would encourage everyone to read the open enrollment report. It's really a historical average of open enrollment. So in our discussions, you know, the consultant said, yeah, your open enrollment is probably going to be larger than what we have. But in their formulas, they take historic open enrollment. So I would say the number's probably a bit low. Um, you know, you, and, and, and they will not allow you to build a building <laughs> uh, larger than what you are projected. There's a little allowance there, uh, but, the, but they're not, the, the state does not um, allow districts to build buildings that are too large in, in hopes that um, uh, you, you can fill the building. In terms of the development, I also talked to the consultant about that because we made sure when we uh, submitted information that we talked about the development. And so because there have been no permits pulled, um, it, it, it's not in there now. Uh, I'll go to a question here from, it looks like uh, whoever's logged in is YS News. Um, why is there, and this might be for Todd and Jeff and Dr. Holden, why is there no option to renovate Mills Lawn using OFCC funds? Could a waiver be applied for in that situation? Yes, it is possible. Um, and I asked the state to run that scenario with keeping Mills Lawn and keeping the middle school, high school. And they basically said our odds of, of getting it a waiver based on a compelling reason uh, through the state's process was low. Because first of all, you had to get both buildings approved to be renovated over two thirds. Then you had to get approved to have two buildings rather than a single building, which is their strong recommendation. Um, and they just told us straight up that although it's not impossible, they projected it to be unlikely. I wanna clarify something about the waiver that would be needed. Um, the state here at the bottom of the screen, the state recommends that a building be replaced when the cost to renovate exceeds 66% of the cost to build new. Right now, the middle school and high school, the cost to renovate it to a like new condition exceeds the cost to replace it. And the Mills Lawn, and this, I, we should note too, this was in 2019 cost sets. These numbers likely have risen at this point. The cost to renovate Mills Lawn is at 96%. So both buildings are significantly over the point at which the state uh, would recommend considering a renovation project. Uh, and also I'd, I'd like to mention too, and Todd, I think maybe you should talk about this. Eli, you just mentioned in the uh, chat that a K-12 at the Mills Lawn site uh, Eli, you say, I do not want a K-12 at the Mills Lawn site. I think it would be horrible. Um, there are logistical reasons why that has not been offered by the state as well. Todd or Jeff, could you share why they have not 
given us an option to put it K-12 at Mills Lawn. Uh, it, it's it's something they don't recommend. I mean, you wouldn't have adequate space on site to have all of your parking on site, all of your bus drop and pick up and playgrounds and practice fields, those kinds of things. Um, it's that, that's the issues of of small sites. Yeah, as as we discussed earlier, the state would recommend uh, for a K-12 building the size that Yellow Springs would require, you would have to have about 47 acres. Now, to our knowledge, there are not 47 contiguous acres available in Yellow Springs. Um, the district owns, uh, of course, the middle school, high school campus, and it is uh, just over 30, I believe. Um, and that is that is doable. The, uh, the other benefit of developing that site is that you've already got a lot of district infrastructure and support structures in place there. Um, so that would be uh, a reason to kind of steer away from the Mills Lawn site. The Mills Lawn is actually less than eight acres. I'm sorry, less than nine acres. Um, and uh, really would be, um, it would really change the nature of that parcel to put a K-12 facility uh, on that site. Jay, I wanna jump in here um, and, and, and address this notion of um, OFCC money and, and compliance um, to their standards. I, I guess I want everyone to understand that this is coming from me. I think we absolutely should explore this possibility. And that's because when I came, what I heard was um, the expense of the 2018 bond issue. I understand that. So in trying to address that issue, this is a viable option for us. Um, I think with the waiver um, to renovate both, both buildings, both sites, it's not only the 66% the um, there is Ohio revised code in my discussions with our OFCC consultant that says that they won't, they won't put money towards, and again, I'm, this is Terry's language, uh, buildings that are less than 350. So that again becomes um, low probability of a waiver approval. We could do, if you think back to those options, we could um, follow, you know, broaden the priorities of the task force and do um, large renovations and repairs to both buildings. But when you look at the cost of that, you're starting to get um, very close <laughs> to what it would be for um, a new building. And, and I'll answer one more thing, and I know you're going in order, Shay, but Chris, I saw your question. Um, in, in consultation with the OFCC consultants, she quite honestly was surprised that we had 26%. She said, uh, I'm surprised you're this high. <laughs> and, and, and the way this works, and, and again, I just wanna be transparent with folks. We have to figure out collaboratively what we're gonna do. But the way this works is that whatever uh, plan is presented to the board, if that involves the OFCC, the board has to approve it um, by April, it goes to the OFCC Board of Control in the summer. That's designed to allow us to be on the ballot in November. Why is that important? It's important because with the ELP program where we get 26% reimbursement, you get two opportunities to pass. So that would give us November and then perhaps May. If you don't pass within a year, you can get back in the program, but you start from ground zero, unlike the other uh, OFCC program, you start from ground zero and you're not guaranteed your 26%. So um, again, that's you know why I say, I think it's, it, it, it's something we absolutely should look at the 26% from ELP. Very good. Uh, I just wanna cover a couple of the questions that have been submitted in the chat here, and, and some of it may have been uh, brought up already or maybe have been covered in previous answers. I just wanna make sure one's voice is heard here. Uh, Dorothy, uh, she says, a question about the state program guideline regarding the minimum amount of students. 
do these guidelines de facto force us to pick a K-12 building to qualify for the 26% funding? Who would like to take that question or should I take a stab at it given the 700 student threshold? Uh, we, we may have covered it a couple of times, but the fact that we are under 700 students and projected to be continually under 700 students, um, that does uh, create a situation in which the OFCC recommends that our 650 to 700 students are located in one K-12 facility. And that does not mean that the building can't be designed to ensure that grade levels are properly separated. Jeff mentioned that during the educational visioning session, it was something that uh, parents, community members, students even brought up as a main concern of if we were on a pre-K-12 campus, how can we make sure that mentoring opportunities exist when we want them to happen, but we're able to separate grade levels the way we want it to happen as well. That's been done successfully at a number of districts, a number of districts that Todd and Jeff and Carrie have designed uh, the buildings for. Uh, so yes, if, if we are going to accept the 26% funding, the highest likelihood is that it would be in a single K-12 facility. And just to reiterate that waivers would need to be requested at multiple levels to have more than one school facility or more than one school campus. I think so that's Shay, the simplest way I could describe it. Yeah, Shay, I'll, I'll just add to that, that um, you know we've said because you're less than 700 students, the state is gonna recommend or drive you toward a single building solution. Um, but that 700 student is not a threshold. Um, the state across the state has been guiding districts who have less than 1,500 students toward a single K-12 solution. Um, so you guys are you know, less than half of that limit, which I think should illustrate the likelihood of the state conceding um, that standard. So uh, I think it's it might be nice and we all might feel like it would be a better solution, but if the district would like to take advantage of that 26% savings um, reimbursement in the future, then uh, I don't see it occurring uh, any other way. I can tell you too, that we were working with a uh, district in Eastern Ohio, Harrison Hills School District. Uh, we recently completed a 188, actually it ended up being a 210,000 square foot facility for 1,460 kids, uh, and they were only given the opportunity to have a single K-12 campus as well. And it's it's functioning very well for them. Uh, but just to reiterate what Jeff said, uh, multiple layers of waivers is unlikely. Okay. I'm gonna try to organize my here uh, and see if I can uh, filter through a few. Uh, we've covered the question about uh, Mills Lawn renovation. Uh, Jeff, I'll give this one to you. Terry Smith asked, uh, SHP, you've used the term educationally fantastic several times. Perhaps that should be a bit more clarified in education terms. Could you describe maybe what educationally fantastic means and what the educational visioning team's primary goal is in defining that? Sure, hey, I'd be happy to. Um, educationally fantastic means uh, a place where students want to be a place where teachers desire to teach in, um, and a place that really fosters um, and accelerates the learning experience. As I mentioned earlier, there are uh, many examples of how the current facilities uh, pro, uh, prohibit, or at least get in the way of um, the, the learning that occurs or that is intended to occur there at Yellow Springs. When your buildings were um, designed and built, uh, learning across the country was really organized in a pretty industrial manner. Um, so, you know, every class, you know, 25 students to one teacher within four walls. And we do that over and over again, um, and that's all it is. Uh, but now with uh, project-based learning, with expeditionary learning, with inquiry-based learning, all of these things that Yellow Springs is trying to take advantage of um, and trying to leverage, those require different kinds of spaces. Uh, now, we don't know exactly what those are. That's up to the educational envisioning team to identify and um, define, but they are, they, the spaces you have today um, are not suited to, uh, to the kind of learning that 
that is trying to take place at Yellow Springs. They could be made to do so um, at considerable cost and effort, but they it could it could work. Very good. Uh, very good. Uh, Terry, I see a follow-up note there. Spaces are defined by how you set them up and how teachers teach in those spaces. Uh, that's definitely something that the educational visioning group is is starting to think about. Actually, just yesterday, we had students in a Tinkercad model, and they were laying out the spaces and finding inspiration images on the, uh, I should say students and teachers, were researching uh, best practices and finding uh, interesting photos that describe the way they wanted to learn. And then we really challenged them almost with a little mini project-based learning effort of its own to learn a new software in Tinkercad. It's something that's used to uh, do 3D printing. And uh, we challenged those groups to kind of uh, express their ideas and their thoughts through that hands-on software. Uh, it turned out really neat. So uh, agreed with you, uh, Terry Smith, that those spaces are really defined with how you set them up and how teachers teach. Thanks for that. Uh, I'll ask a quick question of, um, so we've had a couple of questions around the Antioch campus. Dr. Holden, I'll maybe turn this one over to you, Naomi and Megan Bachman. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, they both had a question, is the conversation about an educational commons on the Antioch campus still happening? And is the Antioch golf course location still on the table? Why is it not listed as one of the options? So I'll take that, and I think Patrick Wake is on here, and he is also part of the uh, collaborative grant. Um, so the, the collaborative grant was designed to explore the possibility to see if there was property on the Antioch campus where there could be a, a education commons education district. So Yellow Springs Community Children's Center, Antioch College, the Antioch School, Yellow Springs Schools. So it's been a long process. I mean, it's been almost a year um, for lots of reasons. Um, but the last thing that has happened has been um, there have been soil samples on a parcel of land down by um, Allen and Corey. So is that still on, and, and, and the result was that the land is viable for building. In terms of space, um, I think it faces some of the issues, not quite as extreme as Mills Lawn and just in terms of space. But that is not, it's not that that is off the table, but, but my response to this is the same as my response to those involved in the um, uh, efforts to preserve Mills Lawn. We're just not there yet, you know. Uh, the state does not, all it takes into consideration right now is what facilities we have and that's what they looked at. Um, in the end, um, I don't know that, that particularly for a new building, that, it, that they're that concerned about the where. We're just not, we're just not to the where. So um, there are just different logistical concerns um, with that. So, um, but again, I, I, I speak to Patrick regularly and, and I just spoke to him and said, you know, that discussion, the Antioch discussion, like the Mills Lawn discussion, is designed to come out of this process where it's open and folks can give input. We're just not there. Very good. Uh, I will go to a question from Mary, uh, and it goes back to the Mills Lawn question, but I just want to make sure it's heard. And Mary, I got this on the ysforward.com website. I saw that you shared this comment. I shared it over with the district uh, right before this meeting. Uh, you asked, uh, people in our community would like to be able to vote for quality Yellow Springs schools and to preserve Mills Lawn green space. Is the school board exploring all options to give us this opportunity? Dr. Holden, I'll just give you a chance to answer that formally. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I just want to make sure we're getting all the questions here. Again, thank you. Again, I mean, and 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 folks, there are teachers on this on this meeting tonight in this forum, as well as students. And I want to give a shout out to the students. Thank you for being brave and uh, attending, giving you know an hour and a half of your time. A again, we all believe in the <laughs> in the benefits of green space. We know that. Um, 
We also have to, you know, we, me, my responsibility is to caretake my children and, and that is the children of the district and make sure that I provide for them facilities that are um, warm, safe, dry, um, efficient, sufficient, but also um, kind of worthy of the who they are and who they aspire to become. So um, we are having that discussion. And, and again, no decision has been made about Mills Lawn and it, it will be a collaborative discussion. Uh, let's see, I have uh, two questions from Matthew Kirk uh, on the first one. Is there any chance the ESC would move maybe to the old Green County Career Center and we could reclaim the old middle school? Uh, right now, there have been a few questions about the site size, and I'll just touch on that again. It's just under 35 acres, uh, and right now, um, the state, through their master planning process, I know we have talked about 37 being ideal, but they essentially have deemed that, that what's available on the site and owned by the district right now would be adequate for building a K-12 or an added on or an addition and renovation project as identified in their options. Uh, so at this point, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Holden, but there is not a need or a requirement that we reclaim that site uh, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and, and that site, sorry, I took a drink of water. and. <laughs> <laughs> the the ESC site? Correct. Could that be kind of reclaimed by the district? Well, the ESC actually owns that building, so I can't speak for them. I do not like it when folks speak for district-owned property, so I would not uh, begin to speak for that. Um, you know, I think if, if that was the will to have a K-12 on the Enon Road site, I think we could make that happen, but I can't you know, I can't speak to that. Again, I will say, having having had some understanding of schools that enter into building projects, there are lots of creative ways to use uh, the buildings, whether it's you um, rent out part of the building to an ESC or whether you carve out part of the building for, um, I've seen a lot of highly successful community health clinics and medical practices. So there's lots of room to, to think creatively like that. Very good, thank you. Uh, I see just in response to that direct question, um, Eric Oberberg shared, uh, I think uh, Matthew shared the idea that maybe they could move to the old Green County Career Center, but it looks like that is up for auction by the Career Center. So just to, uh, to put that out there uh, for the group. Shay, uh, uh, yes, one, please, thing, Todd. one thing I'll share uh, regarding property acquisition, property acquisition is not co-funded by the state. So any expense you wanna put on property is above and beyond the budget that the state will co-fund. So they say the site is up to you. How much you spend is up to you. Uh, I'll go to another more recent question from Matthew about why can't we build a K-12 based on actual in-district enrollment of 500? Um, Dr. Holden, would you like to, to touch on that uh, in regards to the enrollment projection or kind of how that's calculated? Yes. So the enrollment projections are calculated on the students that we have now. And, and right now we are an open enrollment district. And we have open enrollment students, and and I think um, I think we we gain a lot from that. And many of our open enrolled students have long family ties to Yellow Springs, and so I think um, there's a nice back and forth and, and exchange between our own um, what I would call resident students and open enrolled students, and and I would hate to see that. Um, impacted but to do that you know we already have our enrollment projections that would require us becoming a non-open enrollment district um and and that does not fit my understanding of who we are i, I would share one other thing um 
your state percentage is based upon your equity ranking relative to all other schools in the state. And it's property valuation divided by students. Or wait a minute. Yes. Correct. So it's valuation per student. So the state's whole program is based on counting those students in your district. If you only had 500 students with the same property valuation, your state percentage would be much smaller. So it's part of the deal. Yeah. If we were to go from the 700 students that you have now to the 500, um, that number of what the state would offer to fund would significantly go down maybe into the low teens, just as a, as a rough projection, right? That the state is offering you funding with open enrollment calculated into that process. Uh, I'll turn one over to the SHP design team. Let's have you guys uh, uh, flex your design muscles here a little bit. Carrie, I'll tap you in too. This is a good question for you. Liz Robertson asked, uh, could the team that worked on the K-12 facilities talk a little bit about what a successful K-12 building looks like and how it functions with sharing lunch, gym, and other spaces? I'll turn this to you. This could be a 45-minute question with these guys because they, uh, they're they passionate about school design. They love it. Uh, let's try to limit you uh, maybe to a couple of minutes on some of the, the ways that uh, a K-12 building can be divided by grade level maybe. Oh, I think my first comment is going to be they all look a little different based on what the district requirements are or the community expectations are for how they're functioning. So, but it can look and feel in a variety of different ways. Um, we do tend to look at how we can um, really use space efficiently. So this idea of a shared kitchen, but possibly splitting up lunchroom so we keep students divided. I don't know if anybody's been to um, the middle school at Beaver Creek, but we have a shared kitchen with two separate lunchrooms to accommodate the different age groups. Um, again, that idea of separation, I think it goes back, I think Shay had mentioned this, um, a discussion on when is it appropriate for the students to interact and when is it not appropriate for the students to interact. And we can, you know, come up with different solutions on how we use space to encourage those interactions and to de deter those interactions. Jeff, I don't know if you have anything else to say about that. Um, that's a great explanation, Carrie. Um, you know, I, I will say that when we ask the group, um, you know, what are the kind of pros and cons of having all the students K through 12 on one campus, um, there was, there was significant benefit that they they articulated in just in the interactions that could be afforded. Um, older students mentoring younger students, uh, projects spanning single grade levels, um, you know, students being able to see the work of older students and kind of anticipating the opportunity to take part in that themselves. Um, so there, you know, there's, you know, the classics, you know, what about language? What about um, teenager habits? Uh, all those things that are concerns. Um, I'll say in my experience that when we do blend the grades like that, it, um, it calls the older students to a higher standard. You know, I think they, they intrinsically understand that these younger students are looking to them. And uh, I suspect that it leads to a better outcome for everyone. Um, so that, that's my take on it. But again, we, we make our careers by tuning and designing buildings that react and address your specific concerns. So as we be, continue to identify those, um, we will design to, uh, to accommodate them. And, and we can. I'd like to speak help you. A moment as a teacher, if I can. Yes. Um, sorry, just for the K twelve as a as a young teaching young students and interacting with older students. Um, again, my experience is that they step up. The big kids always step up, and we are amazed. And it's wonderful the way they work together. So, just as a lower elementary student deal, working with even middle school and high school kids that come to Mills Lawn, they have always stepped up. So that's not a large concern for many of us.
Thank you. Thank you. I know. Uh, see Josephine Zinger. I've noticed that as well, Ms. Hoover. Thank you for that. Uh, I saw a question. I'm, I'm trying to go through and, and dig through as much of the uh, of the chat as possible. Um, we are. I, I see Chris Hamilton. You asked, will the chat be saved and shared? Uh, yes, we will be downloading this chat, and we could make that available on that transparency page if you'd like. Uh, we can drop that into there. Uh, I'm, I'm digging through a couple of the, the last few questions I see here. And just a reminder, we are going to uh, cut off at 7.30 in about 10 minutes. I see a couple of questions going back to the Antioch College opportunity. Uh, Dr. Holden, something of note, a couple of people have pointed out potential soil quality issues. Like I, I know I see Matthew and a couple of people had discussed sinkholes through the chat. Um, definitely something to maybe keep in mind as we move forward that the site deserves more investigation. Uh, and Matthew, or I'm sorry, Michael Slaughter uh, asking, you know, Dr. Holden, I'll turn this back over to you. Uh, is it your goal to have a proposal for the Antioch plan by April? Um, it's not my goal to have a proposal for the Antioch plan. It's my goal for us to create a plan for Yellow Springs schools by April. And I think at that point, we would then begin to have the discussions based upon what the plan is. Um, I will say about the um, grant to explore the Antioch site, uh, part of the soil boring work that was done was done to, um, to examine whether it was, it was viable. And I think the general consensus is, is yes. But I will say, like I won't speak for um, ESC property, I can't speak for Antioch College about um, what they are willing to, I, I mean, I, I believe they are willing to, to um, release that property. But again, um, they are in, in, in many ways in the same position we are. We have to be good stewards of money. So um, there is that issue. But I think once we, um, Michael, once we figure out what we're doing, then we figure out where we're doing it. Very good. Um, I just like to, Josephine, I see that you have a lot of comments here in the section. Uh, something that we on the SHP team have been so blown away by, uh, one was Dr. Holden and the administration's commitment to really have student voice uh, leading this process. And once we have the students in the in the room or in the Zoom chat, uh, they've really just blown us away at every grade level with their ability to kind of present and, uh, and thoughtfully share their thoughts. So Josephine, I hate to put you on the spot, um, you've been so well-spoken through our process. Would you like to share uh, anything about what you and your uh, colleagues, your peers have, have been going through with this community advisory or educational visioning process? Um, I just, I'm not really sure what you mean by like the whole process. I think mostly, I think it's been nice to be able to say stuff about it. And from, I think, Sydney, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Sydney also likes the K-12, but I, Sydney, you can correct me if I'm wrong if you don't, but I personally do, I think it's a good idea. Uh, I think, we were you talking to Sydney Roberts there? Sydney, do you have any, any thoughts on the K-12 setup? Yeah, I definitely think the K-12 is a good idea. I enjoy getting to interact with students younger and older than me and learn either way and help teach either way. So yeah, cause I really enjoyed when we got to do like stuff like Spidey in our classes, which is when like, um, which is a group of high schoolers who would come into the younger grades and just talk about like, basically like life skills and making good decisions and whatnot. And I always enjoyed those days. Cause then you get to like talk to people who are older than you, but not in like a tutoring kind of way, but in a person kind of way. Um, I also think it's nice that you're getting student opinions on this. It really makes me feel like, feel like students are being heard in this process, which I think is important because schools are for students. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, Josephine. Um, I think even in elementary school, like the buddy system we had between like sixth graders and kindergartners, was really fun for me as a sixth grader and as a kindergartner, I really enjoyed it. And I think that dynamic could be moved kind of similarly, um, like a similar dynamic to the new K-12 link, if that's what's cited upon. 
You're good. Thank you. Thank you. I see a lot of uh, great, uh, great thoughts here coming up and some ideas that are popping up in the chat. Uh, Parker Buckley uh, wrote, has there been any consideration of building with the flexibility to incorporate social and or medical services at some point? Uh, Dr. Holden, would you like to, to address that at all? Well, I think that, um, yeah, no, I mean, I just mentioned it. I, in, in talking about how other districts have designed their uh, buildings to really be in many ways, community hubs. Um, so I know that that possibility um, does exist. Very good, thank you. Uh, I see a, a question from Eric Oberg here, and I apologize, I'm trying to kind of keep up in the chat and, and grab as many questions as I can. Uh, Eric writes, because affordability is the main issue for many, and some say they won't vote for any levy, can we address the cost of doing nothing? I feel it may be more in the long run. Uh, anyone from Dr. Holden or anyone from the SHP team would like to address kind of the, the cost of doing nothing uh, and maybe where we stand right now in terms of our maintenance budget and permanent improvements? Well, the, the, do you, by the cost of doing nothing, do you mean option zero or do you mean just break fix? We can say option zero. I guess I'm saying a Band-Aid now means a Band-Aid later means a Band-Aid later. And if three Band-Aids equal one new prosthetic that lasts for longer than the three Band-Aids, <laughs> let's make that clear. I mean, my, my, my take on it is doing nothing is not an option. You've got to put more money into the buildings that you have to keep them long-term. I mean, I think that's the, somehow you've got to, you've got to move forward. If I could add too, we, uh, uh, something, um, I, think, I believe it's Ms. Hamilton that it's come in a couple of times from the facilities task force. What are, you, what are we kind of doing with that information? Uh, one of the things from the task force and one of the things I think we learned from the previous bond issue defeat was that there was a message out there in the community that we weren't maintaining the buildings maybe the way that people wanted us to. Uh, so I'm gonna share uh, just a quick screenshot here from uh, our transparency site. Uh, from the previous bond issue attempt, uh, this is a link to all of the maintenance costs by year from 2013 to 2020. Uh, when the facilities task force made their recommendations for uh, most important pieces uh, to, to tackle. Uh, the district did respond with a, a jump in this uh, permanent improvement money coming from the general fund. I think there's an important note here in the second, second uh, paragraph that right now, an average, since 2013, an average of $267,000 a year is spent on maintenance and uh, capital improvements. Uh, but not all of that comes directly from the taxpayer voted permanent improvement levy. There are general fund dollars that are being diverted away from the classroom to address the building maintenance uh, and to, to continue to, uh, to, to share Eric's uh, term, a, a Band-Aid. Uh, but you can get on the transparency site and see all those costs and understand how much is coming from the taxpayer funded levy versus how much is coming from the districts operating in general funds. So just wanna put that out there uh, that, it, that it was in there uh, for, for everyone's analysis on that transparency page. I'll share a figure um, that's, that's used nationally on maintaining schools, that if you had a new school that was built today and it was brand new, the average cost to maintain that building in a state of renewal would be around $3 per square foot per year. You have over, over 120,000 square feet of building right now to put $3 a square foot in those per year. Um, so yeah, you're at $360,000 a year and that only maintains it in its current status. If it was new, it would maintain it new. If it was in the condition it is now, it will maintain it in the condition it is now. So that's the challenge. You're not yep. spending that much and you haven't spent that much ever and nobody in Ohio is, so right. it's a challenge. Shay, I saw a comment um, in the chat kind of inquiring about um, why not just use the land that the district already has. And I just wanted to kind of clarify that um, 
you know, the K-12 option uh, could be delivered on the existing middle school, high school campus. Um, it could be, you know, the new facility could be constructed, you know, while that, while the current facility is in operation. Uh, we do that often and uh, nearly everywhere. <laughs> uh, that's very common for how we do things. Um, so it, it is a, a distinct um, possibility, yes. And we want to be respectful. Is we know a K-12 is feasible because you have that land. Mm -hmm. You choose to put it on another site, find another better location, it still works. And we're dealing with feasibilities at this point and trying to get our arms around all of those components and costs. Uh, it has reached 7.30. Uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, we are copying down the chat from this. Uh, and if I haven't done a great job of getting to your question, uh, trust that we will be grouping your comments and your thoughts and sharing these with the community advisory team. That's really a big piece of this. I know there are a few community, actually a lot of community advisory team members on here. And we hope that your feedback, uh, both through your present for any questions you've asked or what you've shared in the chat, uh, that is going to contribute to the discussion, uh, the, the long-term discussion by the community advisory team. If there are any questions that we did not answer, we're going to try to compile these into a frequently asked questions to share on the district website. Um, it's going to be a lot to get them all down and answered. So maybe early next week, we'll have those posted uh, that you can start to share and start to ask more questions on the site. I know I keep uh, wearing you out with this, but the website URL, ysforward.com, this is an opportunity for you to learn as much as possible about the process. Dr. Holden's really made it a priority to be as transparent as possible. So there's a, a lot of documents for you to review uh, and there's an opportunity all the way through the process to share your questions, comments, concerns, ideas, uh, loves and hates uh, can all come through the site and all of that is provided to Dr. Holden and the administration and the Board of Education, as well as the community advisory and educational visioning teams. So thank you for your time tonight. I see that our chat window is, is, is continuing to, uh, to grow here in my notification window, um, but we will document all of your questions and get them down uh, from here and post it as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for being a part of this process. Uh, there are upcoming community forums again. Our next one is March 4th at 6 p.m. Uh, in, in the same formats uh, with the same information uh, links provided uh, as this one. Submit all your additional questions and look for the responses posted shortly at ysforward.com. Dr. Holden, I'll turn it over to you for the final word. Thank you, everyone. I just want to um, let you know that this is, uh, this is something that we cannot get done alone, but it takes all of us together. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Good night.